Good evening, uh, and welcome to our talk uh, about ideas for finer grained uh, control over your heat budget. Uh, my name is Amit Kucheria, and I have, I'm presenting this with this talk with my friend and colleague, uh, Daniel Lascano. Say hi to the camera, Daniel. Uh, so in this talk, we are going to uh, talk about some of the common use cases uh, in uh, thermal management um, in, mobile, in the mobile industry and uh, uh, take you through some of the caveats and the limitations we have in the current frameworks and propose some solutions. So let's dive in. So here's the outline of the talk. Um, we are going to go through some terminology uh, and then discuss the goals for the thermal framework. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about the Linux thermal framework, uh, how it is used in the, in the real world and what the current limitations are. And then finally, we're going to get uh, to what our proposal is to improve uh, things going forward. All right. So here is a picture of what uh, happens uh, currently in the Linux uh, thermal framework. So you have uh, in the graph uh, uh, two colors. Uh, the purple one is uh, for the high key board, uh, which is a octa-core Cortex A53. This is an older board. And the green line is a newer board called as the high key 960, which has uh, four A73s and four A53s. Now, both of them uh, have a workload that starts roughly at about the five second mark. And what you see immediately is how quickly uh, the high key 960 uh, jumps up to around the 80 degree mark. So this, this workload is basically trying to uh, generate as much work as possible and get the platform to heat up. So what you see here is that within about 100 milliseconds, uh, the high key 960 is, is reaching a temperature of 80 degrees, while on the older platform, it takes roughly about 30 seconds to reach that same temperature. And then what you see after that is the platform or the thermal framework throttling the CPUs, throttling the frequencies to keep the temperature in check. So this is the stage for, for this talk and how, how we want to prevent these kinds of situations and hotspots. So let's get on with the terminology that we are going to need for this, this talk. So the first one is uh, junction temperature limit, uh, also known as TJ. So that is, TJ is essentially a threshold, uh, the surface of your chip or the silicon or the CPU. So beyond which uh, your silicon can get damaged. Uh, this depends on the manufacturing process of the silicon. So we've seen boards or SOCs uh, where uh, this temperature can be around 80, 90 degrees. And uh, I've, I've seen uh, Qualcomm silicon, for example, that I'm familiar with, where this, this number is about 120 degrees. Now, the platform in question may or may not have uh, firmware that may trigger an emergency shutdown uh, in the case that the temperature reaches this point. But this, this temperature, the junction temperature, uh, is a threshold that you cannot allow your platform to cross. Otherwise, silicon will get damaged. The next term is the skin temperature, also known as T-skin. So this is a temperature that is perceived by the user to feel too hot. So when you actually hold a mobile device or a tablet uh, or even a netbook or a laptop, um, this is the temperature at which point you start to feel that the thing is too hot in my hands. Uh, you've probably already experienced this when you're trying to run a video or play a game for any length of time and you see the back cover of your, of your phone or a tablet heating up. So this is the temperature uh, that you cannot cross uh, beyond which uh, not only with the user feel that the device is too hot, but if you allow it to uh, go too high, there is a risk of um, 
burns, severe burns caused to the user. Uh, and of course, this will lead to liability issues. What you see in the graph here, uh, sorry, in the picture here, is uh, a photo of two, two phones. The one to the left uh, shows no hotspots. So everything is yellow, green, blue. Uh, the one to the right has this big red hotspot uh, uh, where the SOC uh, and the memory and the other parts of the chip are. So the one to the left is, is a better designed phone in that it's able to dissipate all this heat that's generated very nicely and uniformly so that nothing feels too hot to touch. Whereas the one on the right, there's going to be this nice hot spot uh, around the top of the phone. There are various uh, standards which define how long and uh, on what uh, materials uh, you can hold uh, a phone without burning your skin. Obviously, the larger the form factor, uh, the easier it is uh, to dissipate all the heat. And so the form factor plays a very vital role in, in, uh, in controlling skin temperature. Uh, the final term we need for this presentation is thermal design power, um, also called TDP. So this is uh, the budget in, in watts. It's the power budget in watts uh, to sustain uh, performance uh, on a chip. Uh, Typically, in a high uh, performance use case, uh, you want to sustain the performance at, at, uh, at the TDP limits for as long as possible without overheating. Um, and that is the core of what this talk is about, the TDP, how to control and balance the TDP. Uh, so things like higher the ambient temperature, uh, the lower is your dissipation budget. So if you are uh, using the same phone uh, when the, where the ambient temperature is 25 degrees versus uh, using the phone where the ambient temperature is 40 degrees, uh, you've lost about 15 degrees of headroom in how quickly your SOC will reach uh, uh, the T-skin and the T-junction hotspots. Um, so everything in, in the mobile world and uh, uh, electronics is anything that a user will touch is, is designed around TDP. Uh, things are a little more uh, flexible in the server PC world, uh, and I'll come to that uh, in a second. So uh, what are the goals for TDP management? Um, I'm going to divide uh, the type of devices into two, one which I call fixed TDP devices and the others which are called flexible TDP devices. So when I say fi uh, fixed TDP devices, these are typically passively cooled devices. They have a small form factor, there's no additional fans or anything, um, and uh, all they have to do is operate under the TDP budget. These are typically battery powered devices, but not necessarily, but uh, typically they are. Um, and so you, you want to operate under the TDP budget. Uh, without hitting the T-skin uh, temperatures and going, going over and above that. So you want to sustain the performance at the TDP budget. And uh, depending on what use cases you're running, whether it's GPU intensive or CPU intensive, uh, you want to dynamically balance uh, uh, your dissipation budget among the uh, different uh, components on the SOC. Then there is the flexible TDP devices. Uh, these are actively cooled devices. So they share all of the goals uh, of the fixed TDP devices above, but they have some flexibility in that they can have internal fans, liquid cooling, or even external uh, things like uh, in, in the case of a server, they can be in an air conditioned room, which, which uh, helps uh, them with their TDP budgets because it cools the overall environment down. So the goal for TDP management is to operate as long as possible at the at a sustained performance while uh, not uh, while not regressing your use case. The use case uh, in question um, can be anything, whether it's playing a video or whatnot. So obviously, uh, most people are familiar with uh, what are the major sources of heat. So it's typically the CPU, GPU, uh, any connectivity, your modem, Wi-Fi. Uh, DSPs, accelerators, and lately uh, neural processing units, um, and the camera and memory. These are also uh, sources of heat. So 
with these sources of heat in your uh, typical device, uh, what are the challenging use cases? So I've listed a few use cases here, uh, mostly around the VR, augmented reality, there's some gaming, um, the typical phone use case where I'm taking a phone call, I'm streaming a, a movie or, or simply web browsing. Um, each of these has multiple uh, IP blocks on the SOC uh, that are generating heat while they are running. And the, the trick is to balance all of them uh, so you can uh, so you can keep within the TDP limits and uh, control the junction temperature as well as the skin temperature on the device. So let's take the uh, virtual reality uh, case um, uh, in some detail. So if you've, if you've ever used a headset, uh, I mean, typically there have been um, uh, headsets uh, of the, uh, in the current generation uh, are 1080p resolution and maybe 60 frames a second. Um, since these are battery powered, they have a limited uh, uh, um, dissipation budget uh, because they can only supply a limited amount of power and the processors can only run uh, at a certain frequency, at not more than that. So uh, the interesting thing with virtual reality is that as soon as you stop dropping frames, uh, people start complaining uh, about dizziness. So this, this entire use case is, is built around having extremely high resolutions and extremely high frame rates to, to mimic uh, the eye uh, in the real world. So under that limited thermal budget, if you start throttling your CPU or your GPU or your video uh, decoder, you will start dropping frames and that may cause dizziness. So you've, you've basically uh, um, regressed your use case in that case. So the trick here is how do you in, uh, allow the GPU and the memory, uh, which is uh, most often the big consumer in this, this particular use case, how do you allow it a bigger share of the thermal uh, dissipation budget uh, compared to the CPU, for example? Uh, there are other use cases here like uh, uh, streaming movies. So in this case, your connectivity uh, IP, so that could be your 4G connection, 5G connection, or Wi-Fi, that's constantly uh, streaming in network data. Uh, you have your video decoder that's taking this data and putting it to a display uh, to the GPU. And the CPU might be doing background tasks or, or participating in frame rendering in some form. Now, all of these are competing uh, for uh, running and all of these are causing heat. So you have to balance uh, uh, the thermal budgets of all of these uh, for, for, a, for a nice uh, experience where you don't exceed the T-skin or T-junction. So um, having discussed uh, the challenging use cases, uh, let's take a look at what the current Linux thermal framework looks like. So here's a picture of the thermal framework and uh, unfortunately I've lost uh, a couple of uh, um, text blocks uh, in slide conversion, my apologies. But to the bottom right, the box, the red box is essentially your sensor. And the one above that is the thermal zone. And then the light yellow box above that uh, is, uh, is essentially your governors. So what we have here is the sen there's a bunch of sensors in your on your SOC. Um, these are physical sensors that give you uh, send back temperature data across the SOC. Uh, these are connected to the Linux thermal framework through thermal zones. That's the bigger red box. And then um, there is uh, uh, there, there are governors, which are basically algorithms, heuristics you use. Uh, to try to uh, cool down the device uh, when you, you detect a hotspot at, at a given sensor. Uh, there are various algorithms like stepwise, IPA, user space, fair, bang, bang for different uh, use cases that you can choose from. Uh, the interesting bit is the cooling devices. So, so what the thermal framework allows you to do is, is configure uh, for each thermal zone uh, 
some cooling devices, uh, which which effectively uh, throttle the performance of uh, certain IP blocks or activate uh, uh, external fans and whatnot. So you have, again, two types, as I said uh, earlier, active uh, cooling and passive cooling. So in the active cooling, you might have a GPIO, a PWM, or you just turn on a fan directly um, to, to cool down your device. Whereas in the passive case, uh, let's take the example of a CPU and a GPU. So you might want to slow them down. Uh, the CPU, you have two options today in the kernel uh, using the CPU FRET framework and the CPU idle framework. Uh, and with the GPU, there's a def fret framework that you can use to do something similar. Uh, the kernel also has the concept of the energy model, which basically is a table containing the performance state of a device or an IP block in uh, on the SOC and its power cost. So the CPU fret and the CPU IO subsystems um, can uh, look up uh, the energy model table uh, to make the right decisions about what would be the right performance state for uh, a CPU. And in the GPU case, uh, there are now patches floating where we are, the DEFREC uh, subsystem is also starting to use the energy uh, uh, model. So with this look at uh, the thermal framework, uh, let's have a look at uh, something in practice. Uh, some measurements that we've done. So you have uh, two diagrams here. Uh, the one on the top essentially shows a use case where we were uh, setting the operating point from user space for on, on a given platform. So let's, let's assume that the platform has eight operating points. So we started with the bottom most operating points, let's say 500 megahertz, and then kept uh, increasing the, the operating point or the frequency of the, of the chip. And uh, you can actually follow that with the red uh, dotted lines that you see above. So uh, you, you had an operating point, let's say 500 megahertz, then you bumped it up to uh, let's say 700 megahertz and you see a slight jump in temperature from uh, roughly 30 degrees to slightly above 30 degrees and so and so forth you go uh, around the 600,000 mark in the in, on the time scale um, you see that the temperature has gone up to roughly 65 degrees and then uh, going further the temperature is, is reaching nearly 80 degrees. Uh, another thing to notice here is that uh, the length or the width of the red lines is decreasing as you go forward. That's because uh, the workload being given was dry stone, which was uh, basically uh, told to do a given amount of work uh, as quickly as possible. So obviously, as you increase the frequency of the processor, it takes less and less time to do the same amount of work, except when you reach around the 600,000 mark on the time scale. And at that point, uh, if you see the last big peak, uh, you see that the red line is actually quite wide. The reason for that is that we have reached the 80 degree limit, which was the junction temperature for that platform in question. And we started uh, cooling, and cooling down by scaling on the frequency. So what, what is happening here is you're constantly throttling the frequency and then going back up and back down and back up and back down. And so you're, you're basically, uh, you, you, you might be going, uh, if you look at the, the, the diagram below, uh, you see a corresponding uh, change in cooling state between two and three. So you're basically switching between cooling state two, cooling state three. And that can mean anything on, on a platform. In this case, I think it was like three different operating points. So you, you might be going from 1.2 gigahertz to 700 megahertz and back and forth and back and forth. So that's the correlation between the cooling states and the temperature. And the real world usage of all this, uh, how, how the thermal framework is used. So currently uh, it is used to throttle uh, any available IP blocks for both uh, junction temperature and skin temperature uh, mitigation.
Uh, then you have user space thermal demons that rely on these uh, the thermal uh, network interface, uh, thermal framework interfaces. Um, they allow, uh, they, they read their temperatures for each sensor from SysFS. And then they have a way to set the cooling device state. So I, they can say that I want to go to cooling device state one, two, three, etc. These are opaque numbers. They don't mean anything other than they, they map, map to a certain perf uh, performance point. Then uh, more sophisticated demons might actually use uh, the knowledge of the use cases running on the system, whether it's a gaming use case or it's a web browsing use case. So they, they have ways of detecting that. And they, they might use that to throttle specific devices. So you might say things like, uh, I'm running a game. It's mostly GPU bound. Uh, I want to throttle the CPU. And so the thermal demon can do that from user space. It might send a hint to the GPU uh, to drop resolution if we are maybe uh, heating up too much or dropping uh, or uh, running out of battery. Uh, then there are non-Linux devices, devices that are not uh, known to Linux. They don't run Linux, uh, but they are present as part of the SOC, so something like a modem. Uh, they might send uh, hints to the modem through a mailbox API. To, to try uh, to tell it to try to reduce performance if possible. So these are some of the ways in which the thermal framework uh, is currently used. And so let's go to the limitations of uh, what we have here. Um, so the number one limitation today is if when you throttle uh, uh, a CPU, if this CPU is sharing a clock line with other CPUs in a cluster, you might end up uh, throttling the entire uh, cluster and you might lose performance uh, as a result unnecessarily. So one uh, recent addition to the thermal framework is the concept of idle injection, uh, where by you can inject idle on just that CPU without throttling the entire cluster. So that might be a good uh, way to deal with uh, CPU specific hotspots. The other problem limitation uh, with the framework today is that the user space demons uh, set opaque uh, cooling device states. So they just say one, two, three. What, do, what this one, two, three corresponds to, it, uh, nobody knows except the person who has actually characterized that particular device. So there's, there's, there's an engineer who's basically gone and tested uh, this device at various use cases and said that in the gaming use case, I want to throttle the CPU uh, to a cooling device state too. That's it. And on a new device, it could be a completely new a new number. So it's it's really opaque. Uh, this doesn't help in in actual uh, in the actual um, configuration and uh, um, uh, in configuring the, the system uh, for different types of devices. Uh, running the same SOC. So the same SOC could be running on a phone versus a tablet, and it will have completely different uh, configurations. The other limitation currently is that the, the user space demons and the internal gover govern, uh, governors are competing for decisions. So in, in, in a lot of cases, the user space might simply override the kernel governors and confuse them. So if you have something like a PID controller in the, in the kernel, uh, it might get completely confused because the user space just randomly uh, programmed uh, the cooling device state for a certain device. And now uh, it, the internal government needs a while to catch up uh, with that. Um, another limitation is that the internal governors don't actually talk to each other or share information. They're using completely different interfaces. So the key observation here uh, after all this is that the skin temperature management is essentially a balancing of the TDP. It's, it's, a, it's a balancing act wherein you have to share your TDP uh, between uh, different IP blocks. And this TDP is in watts, not in direct temperature uh, units. So not degrees Celsius, it's in watts. You want to be able to say something like this uh, GPU has a budget of two watts. Not that go hit 70 degrees and then I'm going to ramp you back up. So this is the key observation that 
we are taking into our proposal. What we are proposing is very simple. We are saying that we should separate thermal management from power capping. What is power capping? Power capping is essentially a use case based throttling uh, to hit certain TDP uh, numbers. So any kind of TDP balancing is, is basically capping power uh, of an IP block. And so what we are proposing is that uh, junction temperature management should happen in the kernel and should be taken care of by the thermal framework. While, whereas T-skin management, so the skin temperature management, uh, should needs hints from the user space and so should happen in the power cap framework. And with this, I'm going to hand over uh, to my colleague, Daniel, to take us through the proposal of how the power cap framework can be used. So, yeah, my name is Daniel Escano. I'm working in Lina, Linaro, and uh, I'm co-maintaining with uh, Ryu Zhang the thermal, the thermal framework in the Linux kernel. So, yeah, so we have a proposal, and this proposal is uh, to use the power capping framework existing today. So let me introduce the power capping uh, very quickly. So the power capping is a CCFS interface. Um, it's actually is an empty shell, giving a unified API for, for the user space through the CCFS um, control files. So we have a directory, and this directory is a node for a device, and this directory contains a set of files. You uh, decide which files you want to create, but they are basically um, divided in two categories. The first one is the power limit, and the second one is the, the power consumption, the actual power consumption. And uh, we also have the information about what, what is the maximum power consumption for this, um, this device. Uh, the, power, uh, the power capping framework is an empty shell. So it's empty and it's up to the different controller to write the backend, um, the ba the backend logic behind for the power capping given the different platform we have. So today we have the Intel wrapper register, which gives us um, the possibility to limit and read the energy consumption of the processor of the memory um, and set that through the MSR register. So that's the only controller we have today. Um, by essence of this directory creation, we have uh, automatically this the an hierarchy and we can set a constraint on a node and the, ch the child will inherit the constraint, obviously, with this approach. On the other hand, we have uh, all, also the user space tools. The user space tools are, we have a command line, so that gives us an abstraction is, instead of having to deal with the, the, the CCFS internals. And we have a library, so that simplifies the, the connection between this power capping framework and uh, applications. On the, um, yeah, so here we have a figure seen that shows a typical, a typical SOC um, where we have DSP. The, the, so these are different source of heating on the system. We have the SOC, DSP, GPS, modem, GPU and package. The idea is when we create this hierarchy, the sum of the different numbers we have at the same level uh, is equal um, when well, the parent um, has the same number that the sum of the children. So in the, um, the W number here we have is an example, it's just to give an example that we, when we sum the children of package, it's, it's 100. So the, the number for package is 100. So by doing so, we can, um, we can measure the power of each devices and then sum them and say, okay, the power consumption for package, it's the sum of my children and read directly the consumption of the package. So on the, we, had, we have the power capping framework today. And we have on the other side, we have the energy model, which was introduced for the EIS, which is the energy aware scheduler. And this um, EIS, is as 
to deal with the big and the little and it's poor information energy information to do the best to take the best decision to put task around we have the big is is almost eight times consuming more power than the little so the little are very energy efficient and the, the big are very poor uh, compute um, well uh, compute have a very high compute capacity and so we have to take the right decision otherwise um, we cannot save any uh, any we cannot save any, any any power in this case so we really need here information about the power consumption in, in order to do the right decision take the right decision so that's what provides today the energy model which is basically an, a, a table giving the performance state we can call that OPP and on uh, on the other side we have the, uh, the on the table we have the, the power consumed for this performance state and with this information we have enough information to know at least what is consuming the the device because we can know the performance state and thanks to the performance states we can know the power consumed um, as we have this performance state and the power we can Mod, do a model of constraints um, with the power cap hierarchy and show not necessarily the, the the connection between the devices in terms of hardware where we don't want to represent the floor plan but what we want to do is to create show the constraint between these devices uh, in order to to balance the power budget across the different nodes so as we saw before in the in the figure we can Sum, um, we can sum the, the number for, of each children and we get for the, for the parent uh, the sum of the children. So the parent on ma max power is the, max, the sum of the max power of the children and the power limit of the parent is the sum of the power limit of the children. In this tree, in this hierarchy, the leaves of this tree are the devices themselves. Uh, being able to give their power consumption through the energy model. So, of course, the devices are not consuming the same amount of power and we need a way to, to characterize that. And for that, we use um, weight, the weighted node with, in this tree. We use for each node of this tree which is the uh, component of the power cap uh, directory, we can uh, add um, show a weight for each of them. And that characterizes the amount of, uh, of power they are consuming when they are running. And that is based on the maximum power. So it's just a percentile. So we have the sum of at each level, which is equal to 1024. The 1024 is a uh, common practice in the kernel for optimization uh, purpose. Of when uh, dividing and it's a way to show a percent percentage of usage so here we in the example of the package we can see that the big is consuming much more power than the little and for this reason the weight is higher so that means if we set a power budget uh, at the top level the big node will get the highest uh, the highest power, power limit power budget from uh, from the parent So now let's show an example on how all this can work together. So we do a redistribution of the power limits. So we restrict the, the example on, some, on something simple and already existing today. So we have the package, the big little and the memory. And then we decide to set the power limit of, on, on this package of 2,008 milli, 800 milliwatts. So that leads us to this table. So we saw on the left column, we have little, big, and memory. On the, uh, the, the column in the middle, we have the weight of different nodes, the little, the big, and the memory. That's the weight we had just before in the figure. And then we use this weight to distribute the memory limit, the power limit we, we put on the parent. And that leads us to these numbers uh, in the static limit column. 
So the next information we have here is the dynamic limit. So at the beginning, we stick to the static limit. Um, the, 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 the constraint we have here is the dynamic limit, the total in the dynamic limit is always equal to the, uh, the total of the static limit. So it's 2,800 milliwatts here, always. Then we have the column with the different devices using uh, power. And then we have the free power uh, column. And we can see here that the big, um, the, the, big, uh, the, the big device, which is the big cluster, has a very high power limit, but it is actually consuming a very little um, number of um, power in this case. So it remains 1,450 milliwatts for this device. And it's a waste of power. We should be able to give this power to the older children in this case. So giving, giving them the opportunity to work, to, to, to work in at a higher performance state. So for that, we take the free, the, the free usage of uh, the, the free power we have for the big and we apply the remaining weight we have. So here we have 128 and 256, which is uh, roughly 30, 33% and 66%. And so we give 33% uh, of the free power to the little and 66% to the free power to the memory. Here we have the dynamic limit, which change, but the total is always the same as the static limit, which is what, what we want. The used, the used power is always the same. It does not change. And the free power is the same, of course, um, because uh, we don't have any power usage changing here. So now the little, actually, it has, has more room for power and wants more performances. So it is increasing its power. And it happens that it reaches the point where it has an OPP of seven, seven, uh, 766 milliwatts. So it remains some power which are unused, but it's, it's okay, it's fine because we don't need more power. And the use of power is under the limit, which is what we want. And the power is equally uh, distributed uh, among the different children. And so that's fine. Now, the big wants more power. And because he wants more power, it, it reached the point where it, it's, it is consuming one, 1,450 milliwatts. And we break here the power limit. So we are above this limit. So we have to do something now for that. So first step is we reset the dynamic limit and now the big is okay. It's in, in, in the limit, but the little is above this limit. And we see that we still have 300 milliwatts to be distributed. So we apply the same now. So 33% 33 to, the, to the 300, which is 100 and 60, 66% to the, to the 300, which is 200. And we have still, we are still violating the power limit, but we still have 200, which is not needed for the memory. So we can take this 200 and give them to the little. But we are still above the limit. So there is no free more power and we have one which is above its own limit. So we don't have the choice. We need to cap it. We cap it, then that reduce the user, the user power. And now the maximum, the user power is equal to the dynamic limit, which is equal to the static limit of the, 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 the entire package. 
So we saw that uh, do, by doing that, we are able to put constraint on the node and let the children to balance their power and give their power and, and taking them back. But also we can, we, we might want to create uh, some bandwidth to the children. Um, so by, by setting, for example, a constraint on the parent and setting a constraint on a child, only one, one child, then we can force this power limit. So the distribution will be against the ones who did not, did not set their, their power limit. So we dedicate a bandwidth to the, chi to the children. Also, we saw that uh, we can create for the same node different constraints, several constraints for the same node. And that is unlimited. We can put any constraint we want. And each constraint, we can define a semantic for it. So we have constraint zero, which is what we are just we are just described right before, setting a power budget. But now we can say, OK, I set up this power budget, but I, I will let um, this power budget being uh, break, but during an amount of time. So that allows, for example, the um, patch rendering without capping the power. We let the patch, the page rendering. So we we, we absorb the peak of load without um, without capping everything. So that gives us some room. It's like uh, the turbo mode of the the CPU frag. Um, also, we have the power limit timeout. So if we have a lot of constraint, we can say, okay, I, we set this constraint and this constraint will automatically be removed after, after a while. And that might help the user space to manage the constraint. So today the status is uh, we have the, the, the energy model. The energy model is relatively new. It was introduced with the EIS, which is, uh, I believe, is uh, coming from uh, the kernel number 3.4, not sure, but um, it's recent. And it's, it is still evolving. Um, there is currently the work of uh, Lucas Luba, which is trying to, well, which is generalizing the energy model to the struct device, which is a very good thing. So that means we give the opportunity to every device on the system to define their energy model if they want to. Um, what would be needed is the power QS because we might have different devices belonging to the same power, uh, to the same voltage domain, and we might want to set the power for this um, domain without impacting the other devices, and we want to. To, to do that like the FREC QoS we have uh, today in the, um, uh, in, the, in the PM QoS framework. Obviously, if we want to have something unified in the, po in the, in the power cap with the energy model, something uh, uh, consistent, we should add a get and set power uh, uh, callbacks inside the energy model structure in order to, to, um, to abstract the, uh, this, uh, this operation and let the power cap energy model being as much as 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 much as generic as possible also the gpu support is relatively new and we need to improve the metric with the load and make sure that they are consistent across because uh, let's imagine we have uh, the highest opp on the gpu it's consuming a lot of power but actually the dynamic power is 80 percent because the load is 80 percent if we don't take care of this 80 percent uh, and we consider that we are consuming 100% of this OPP, it's 20% difference. And 20% on a GPU, it's a big amount of power. And we need that to balance the power across the, the, the other children. Concerning the work we are doing with the power capping using the energy model, we are working in the prototype and right now we are at the level of automatic power rebalancing, which is a bit complex. Uh, it's working, but we are still we have still issue with that. And the next step when that will be when that is fixed is to do power versus performance measurements. And and of course we have to compare that with the existing solution we have the, with the thermal demons. In the future, we need of course to have more. Uh, devices supporting the energy model, and that is uh, challenging 
because we have to include non-Linux devices on the SOC. So we have, um, um, for example, the modem, the discussion is, is through mailboxes. And also we need a way to describe these constraints in the DT. So every SOC vendor is able to define this constraint via the DT and uh, use the, their logic for that. So as a conclusion, the, um, we show that the Temal framework is a bit abused by the different tools to manage the TDP on the entire SOC. And for this reason, um, we think that we should restrict the thermal framework to its primary goal, which is protect the silicon and prevent hotspots. On the, on the other part, we saw that we have more and more complex uh, SOC having a lot of um, source of eating, a uh, source of heat. And this is a, um, a problem to manage that because they are getting more and more complex and the thermal framework does not fit very well in this. And we want to, preserved uh, the temperature for the for skin. Um, that means there is a hole here, there is a meeting, uh, missing feature, and we do believe the power curve framework with the energy, energy model is a good solution because we can modelize, we can model the constraints, and but we, we do not pretend to know how the SOC is working and we can delegate that to the user space, which uh, where the SOC vendors are the one which are the, the best knowledge of all work their, their, um, their SOC. Also, the system is what centric and because we can add more constraints, we have an extensible solution. So, power capping with the energy model, we believe it's a powerful solution and that can make the life easier for SOC vendors. Thank you. Um, we will welcome any questions, uh, if there are any at this point. Uh, we are slightly over time, um, but we still have uh, roughly four minutes for questions. So I have a question. Uh, do you expect the user space implementation to be uh, open source? Um, so if you're talking about a thermal daemon uh, that would use this, uh, we don't see why not. So you, you could still have a uh, open source implementation. Uh, which uh, would take, uh, you, which would uh, provide user space hints to the power cap uh, framework. Having said that, there's nothing preventing somebody uh, from a uh, uh, closed uh, source uh, solution as well. 
Okay, so I think we don't have any more questions. So if you want to reach us uh, offline and ask, uh, uh, ask any question, uh, we are uh, available for that. You can uh, reach us by email also. So thank you very much for attending this session, and I hope this uh, proposal uh, raised some interest from you. Thank you. Amit, do you want to say something? Okay, thank you very um, much. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are available. We are available on uh, on Slack, and uh, you also have our email addresses, and the PDFs are available uh, uh, on the shed.com uh, website. So feel free to contact us. Thank you.